anybody want to get out of the rainy weather and come into a warm uh, weather climate? So I just uh, have the honors of introducing our speaker. Um, first and foremost, I want to welcome a lot of my friends who I've made over the last couple of months. And um, we are very pleased that uh, beginning today we'll begin streaming on Facebook these lectures. So um, we'll record those and have those for future use and certainly tell your friends and you will have access uh, to some great topics and uh, most importantly from some great speakers. Um, just real quick, um, soon you're going to see a lot of construction going on here. Um, it's been something that's been in the works for a number of years. And uh, I don't know if anybody read that we just uh, finalized the big financing package to do some major renovations at the hospital. Uh, my, by the way, my name is Dan Messina and I'm the president. Um, so we just, um, that would help, right? Who is this guy up here talking about this stuff? Um, but, um, so that's a $130 million uh, expansion project that will uh, finally get us going literally over the next month or so. Uh, the construction of a new emergency department, a second floor that will um, will uh, be the home of a new surgical uh, suite uh, that will expand our perioperative uh, department and really bring us uh, very much uh, into a state-of-the-art uh, status when it comes to surgical suites. We're, al we're also doing something which we need uh, very much so uh, in the park, and I'm sure maybe some people Parking. So, although we have valet parking and we have parking in the rear, the hospital continues to grow, and uh, we need to keep pace with uh, making sure we are getting these guys uh, the accommodations they need to come to the hospital. So, that's the project which we literally just started over the last month or so, and that will be picking up again and hopefully be completed. We would expect over the next few short months, and that'll bring us about 240 new parking spots. So. That is, uh, I think, really important. Um, and um, and then, you know, we're, there'll be a, uh, lots of other things that'll be happening in and around the campus. There'll be some major work on replacing uh, most of our elevators in the hospital, uh, doing some other uh, infrastructure work. Uh, the other big project I'll end with uh, is the development of a new co-generation plan. So we will be replacing all of our electrical infrastructure and uh, we'll be replacing it with uh, a new uh, system where we'll, we'll have uh, gas turbines that will basically produce electric. And we will now come off the grid and we will literally be very uh, much self-sufficient, protecting ourselves during disasters and emergencies and con ed issues and all that good stuff. So that's a really, really great. I mean, that's a major uh, investment that we're making on that project. That's Lots of great support I'll end with from all of our elected officials and our state agencies. Uh, they really have rallied with our hospital. Uh, we've been here for 115 years. I was born in the hospital, so I remember this. Uh, but um, it's uh, great things are happening here. We have a great team. I think uh, one of the greatest parts of this hospital is History, but most importantly, the family atmosphere. Uh, and uh, and we do some great things with our medical residents and our students. We have over 150 uh, residents and about 100 medical students that flow through here on an annual basis. So that's uh, that's my little spiel. Um, I could pause for a second if anybody had a quick question about anything that I went over or where anything related to the hospital. No. Okay. Good. I'm glad you. Didn't then he would kick me under the table. <laughs> so uh, I'm really pleased to, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Otterback, who is really one of our young stars here at the hospital. Uh, Dr. Otterback is the chief of our endocrine uh, section. Uh, he received his medical degree from Downstate. And uh, Dr. Otterback is duly boarded um, in, and certified in internal medicine, endocrine, diabetes, and, and metabolism. I guess that's Dr. Otterback will square that title away because I think we get did a little uh, service and we'll <laughs> uh, But uh, I think uh, Phil, come on up. 
we, uh, the great thing about Do Dr. Otterback is he really uh, personifies uh, the, what we're all about as an organization. Uh, great docs with a great commitment to their patients and, and just an incredible family touch. And he's, he's one of our stars, so welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, um, so I too was born actually in this hospital. Um, so uh, I, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Dr. Messina, for the introduction and all he's doing for the medical center. Um, and thank you to the development office for putting these talks together because I think it's important. Um, I can see only a certain number of people in my office every day, and I know I see a lot of my patients in the audience, and you know how busy it is. And this is a way for me to really get the message out about a disease state, both folks that showed up here and also uh, via the internet. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you despite the, uh, the difficulty with the weather today. So today we're gonna talk about an important disease state, which is, um, which is thyroid disease. And um, you know we have three endocrinologists here, me on the, on the side here, and Dr. Wakina and Dr. Kude. Those are the three endocrinologists uh, that, that we work with at the medical center. So when we talk about the thyroid, we're talking about a gland, right? And glands are, um, you know, there are different glands over the different parts of the body. You can see the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. These are glands that actually sit in the brain. But the endocrine system isn't limited to the brain. We have the thyroid gland over here. We have the pancreas, which is in the abdomen. We have the, 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 the gonadal system, the, the reproductive organs. So with, with men, of course, that's the testes, and with women, that's the ovaries. So really, endocrinology covers all, all these hormonal systems literally from head to toe. And how does an endocrine gland work? Well, it sends out hormones, messengers. So basically, something needs to happen in the body, and the glands secrete a hormone that goes to a target organ or a target structure. Let's talk about the thyroid, for instance. The thyroid releases thyroid hormone. And so the thyroid hormone circulates in the blood and finds its target receptor. And just take it, for instance, the heart. The heart depends upon thyroid hormone in order to beat, and beat at the appropriate rate. So the heart's got these receptors, thyroid hormone binds to those receptors, and, and carries out a physiologic function. So as I said, it's a hormone, the thyroid is an endocrine tissue, meaning it secretes hormones, in this case, thyroid hormone into the blood. Now, if you have too much thyroid hormone, right? Too much, excess, that means hyperthyroidism. If you have too little, thyroid hormone, right? It's hypothyroidism. Now, the reasons people have these different conditions we're gonna talk about as we go, but, but, the, but that's an important distinction to make. A fast <laughs> thyroid is too much, and the, and the slow thyroid is too little. So the thyroid, I'm sure all of you in this room know, it helps to regulate the body's metabolism and the metabolic rate. Now, metabolism, um, you, we, we understand, is a very, very complex set of chemical reactions that occur in the body. And if, if, if metabolism is this complicated, we probably understand this much. And I'm sure many of you have had this experience. You, have seen, you see people in your own lives that are naturally thin, and they eat everything in sight, and then there are some people that are a little bit on the heavier side, and they don't eat much at all. And you say to yourself, well, why is that happening? Why is that, how can that possibly be? And that is because we have different metabolic rates. Now, one of the things that controls the metabolism and the metabolic rate is the thyroid. So if the thyroid has too little circulating thyroid hormone, that's gonna make your metabolism slower. If there's too much thyroid hormone circulating, it can make the met metabolism too fast. And the important thing is that the thyroid has receptors all over the body from head to toe. So if you have too much or too little thyroid hormone, you can feel it from head to toe. So say, for instance, how would you feel it in your gut? Well, if you have too much thyroid hormone, it can make you have diarrhea. But if you have too little thyroid hormone, it can give you constipation. So it's very important to determine how, what the thyroid hormone levels are in the blood and if the, 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 doses, if the dose of the medication needs to be adjusted. So where is your thyroid gland? I'm, I've been talking about this gland for a few minutes now. Well, where is it? Well, the answer is it's in your neck. As you can see for this patient, um, well, for all patients, it's beneath the Adam's apple and in front of the trachea or the windpipe. So what do you think would happen if that gland got too big? Well, it might press on that windpipe and cause people a problem, right? As you breathe in, you might be able to get enough air in. 
So if that gland gets too big, it might need to be removed surgically. So what does that mean? Well, what is a big thyroid? A big thyroid is called a goiter. And you can see a picture of a, of a patient with a goiter here. Now, usually we don't see these kinds of large, large goiters so much in this country because usually by that time we would have removed it by, by, by now. But these are patients that have usually live in countries with a severe iodine deficiency. And they can't make thyroid hormone from their thyroid gland. So what, what happens? Well, blood tests go off and that causes hypertrophy or get the gland getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this can cause compression of the airway. So that most likely this person would need their thyroid removed if it was due to uh, just the gland getting bigger and bigger. If the patient just needed iodine, you could maybe give this patient iodine and the gland would shrink. So the question is, are goiters dangerous? Patients come into my office all the time and they'll say, doctor, my gland is big. And I'll say, well, and they'll say, well, is it a problem? Does it need to come out? And I say, well, honestly, I don't know. We've got to figure it out. And how would we figure it out? What would we look at? Well, sometimes glands can be big for a reason. Forgive me, I'm sorry. So sometimes glands can be big for a reason. That is, they're inflamed by antibodies. Um, and that could reflect a fast gland or a slow gland. Fast and slow can both be big, even though they're the opposite condition. Fast and slow can both be big. But if you rule that out, and you have a big gland, then it's a cosmetic issue. And I tell patients, you know, thyroids are like noses. They come in all shapes and sizes. There's not a why of the matter. It's just they happen to be different shapes and sizes. But sometimes when they do have a deficiency of thyroid hormone or their thyroid glands are too fast, then we have to treat those patients with some medications. So has anyone ever seen a patient like this where they have the really big eyes and a big thyroid gland down here? I'm sure you've seen some pictures, at least some pictures. And these are patients that have what they call Graves' disease. Graves' disease is a fast thyroid. And what, how does Graves' disease happen? Well, you have antibodies called TSI antibodies, and they bind to the thyroid gland, cause an inflammatory response, and they stimulate it. And that overstimulation of the thyroid gland results in an excess of thyroid hormone circulating in the blood. And when that happens, patients can get a variety of symptoms that we'll go through in a few moments. So these receptors for these antibodies are also behind the eye. So not only do you get an excess of thyroid hormone in a big thyroid gland, but these, the antibodies bind the receptors behind the eye and push the eyes forward. And you get what they call, well, here they're labeling it bulging eyes. We call it ophthalmopathy, right? The fancy word to say bulging eyes. This can be controlled and treated, of course, but this is what they call Graves' disease. Now, what does it feel like? How would you know if you had something like this, or at least to ask about it? Well, if you have an excess of thyroid hormone, as I said before, you can have symptoms from head to toe. So what are those? Anxiety, irritability, trouble sleeping, weakness in your extremities, tremors. Patients come to me, and I, I, make, I always make them put their hands out when they come in with this, and they shake like this. Sometimes I'll ask them, when you write with a pen, does your hand shake? And they'll say yes. Perspiring more than usual. Difficulty with hot weather, right? So they, they go out in the heat and they feel hot, but they feel hotter than the average person. And they, they literally can't stand that they have to get into air conditioning. That can be a sign of hyperthyroidism. You can also have rapid heartbeats or palpitations. Your heart's beating out of your chest. That can be a sign. Fatigue. Weight loss despite eating or eating or increased appetite. Um, you'll have some patients that present with this condition that they will come in and they will say, doctor, I keep eating, I keep eating, and I can't gain a pound. I continue to lose weight. That's a sign that thyroid might be too fast. And also frequent bowel movements, the diarrhea. So how do we treat this? Well, luckily, we have three approaches, three options for treatment. We can either give a medicine, called methimazole or PTU. These are two medicines that have the capacity to slow the thyroid down, gland down to normal. The second approach is to literally destroy the thyroid gland, give a pill called radioactive iodine, which is done in nuclear medicine. And when we give radioactive iodine, the only part of the body that uses iodine is the thyroid, right? So when you take the radioactive pill, it will go straight to the thyroid, kill it, and then you take Synthroid for the rest of your life, which is thyroid hormone. Or surgery. If you remove the thyroid gland surgically, obviously you've solved the problem. You can't have a fast thyroid with no thyroid in the body, right? So you remove the thyroid gland and then you would take thyroid hormone going forward. Thyroid hormone is essential for life. 
So if you took out a thyroid gland and you didn't take your medication, well, you might be around for a couple of weeks, but then you would die, right? The thyroid hormone is essential for life because, again, it affects you from head to toe. So you would always need to be on medication forever. So thyroid nodules. Now, I showed you a picture of the thyroid before, and here's another picture of the thyroid over here. And here is a little bump, a nodule. So what is a bump? Why do we care? Right? Well, do a lot of people have bumps? The answer is yes. If you do, if you look, um, if you do a sonogram on everybody in the room, two out of three of you will have thyroid nodules. Now, does everybody have a thyroid problem? Well, the answer is no, right? We don't uh, put you through a sonogram all the time. I don't stick needles in your neck for biopsies, right? So we, so we know that almost everybody has these problems or these nodules, but the question is, well, which are the ones that are relevant? And they're, they're relevant, of course, when they get big. 95% of all of these bumps are benign, not cancers. About 5% of the time, they can be cancers. So of course, it's important to know which ones are cancer or which ones are not. So when the doctor feels your neck or you do an ultrasound for another reason, you identify a thyroid nodule, then it's important to know, well, do I have, is this a cancerous lesion or not? And a lot of it depends on the size. Usually about a centimeter in size is where, um, is where we start thinking about doing a biopsy. Um, a centimeter, um, obviously, is maybe the, the first knuckle on your finger, if, for those not familiar with that term. So um, in any case, so, so about 5% are cancer. Most of them are benign. We follow them sonographically with sonograms. If we biopsy it, everything turns out to be benign. Sometimes nodules can cause another problem. They can produce too much thyroid hormone. And in those cases, the patients become hyperthyroid because of that nodule. And those patients we can control the same way we control the other patients with some medication and plus or minus surgery. Okay. So what does a slow thyroid look like? A hypothyroidism, right? A slow thyroid, again, it's, and there's a theme here, antibodies. We talked about the fast thyroid being caused by antibodies, and here's, the, here's another situation where a slow thyroid is being caused by antibodies. The antibodies are binding to the thyroid gland, again, causing an inflammatory response of the thyroid gland, and then killing the cells of the thyroid gland. When that happens, the thyroid begins to slow. This is called Hashimoto's disease. Right? You know, the fast thyroid is called Graves' disease, this one is called Hashimoto's disease. So when the thyroid gland slows, you take Synthroid going forward for the rest of your life, right? Now, how would you know you have a thyroid problem? What symptoms would you be complaining of? Well, symptoms would be lack of energy, getting very cold all the time, developing coarse or thin hair, and getting constipated, right? And, you know, the thing about all of those symptoms, you look at them and you say, well, that kind of sounds like me. Oh, well, that definitely sounds like me. And for me, the, the thin hair definitely is me. But, 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 but the idea is, is, that, is that not everybody that has those symptoms has the disease. So it's important to not only tell your doctor or tell your provider about your symptom um, and, and, and say, but, but it's important to actually have the test to see if you have that particular clinical condition. And the great part of it is it's pretty easy to test for in the blood. So, as I said, uh, you take your thyroid hormone. Um, it is, it is, an, it is, it's unfortunately not like insulin. Insulin is an injectable medicine. This is a hormone that we can take by mouth, so it's much, much easier for our patients to take. What's very important with thyroid medicine, and I know some of you are my patients and are to take this medication, it's important to take that pill on an empty stomach 30 minutes before you eat or drink anything else. If you're taking calcium, it's important to separate that pill by four hours, right? Do not take the pill at the same time as your calcium because you will not absorb the pill and you won't get the clinical and biochemical blood benefit in your blood. Okay, so many, many folks that have thyroid disease happen to be young ladies, right? And one of the things that they come in and they're panicking about is, can I get pregnant if I have this condition? And the answer is absolutely. But there are things that we need to do prior to pregnancy so that we optimize your chances for having, a, a, having and sustaining a pregnancy. We have to check the blood work before pregnancy, ideally, and if the dose needs to be adjusted at that point, it would be important to adjust that prior to conception. Because if, if you have um, a thyroid that's out of control when, when you're pregnant, 
it can cause two problems. One, it can increase your risk for miscarriage, which is a, a difficult thing for patients. And secondly, the baby's intellectual development depends upon having the proper amount of circulating thyroid hormone. So consequently, if you have this problem, it's important to speak to the doctor and make sure your levels are perfect prior to conception. Are there any natural remedies right, for, for thyroid disease? The answer is there are not. People ask me all the time, doctor, is there a special diet that I should use for my thyroid? The answer to that question is no. Now, not to say you shouldn't have a healthy diet, right? I want everyone to have a healthy diet. And what is a healthy diet? I want people to be eating tons of vegetables. I want them to be eating uh, lots of protein, whether it's plant protein or lean meats, right? And I want them restricting their carbohydrates. So my advice to my thyroid patient will be the same advice I would give to my, my diabetic patient. It's the same advice I would give for patients seeing me for fatty liver or high triglycerides, all of those things. High vegetables, tons of vegetables, lots of protein and carbohydrate restriction. So is that going to help your thyroid? Probably not, but it will help every other part of you. So it'll prevent you from getting diabetes, it'll prevent you from getting blood pressure, it'll prevent you from getting overweight, right? So all of, those, all of those conditions would be treatable by the same thing, but I can't say the particular diet with respect to the thyroid would be helpful or harmful. One of the things that's out there relative to the thyroid is iodine. Um, and there's lots of conflicting data on iodine. Some people, if you look on the internet, tell you to take iodine. Some people to say to avoid iodine. And then the question is, well, what should you do? And the answer is, we don't, generally speaking, have iodine deficiency in this country. Why is that? Why don't we have iodine deficiency? Because if you look, when you buy salt, I'm sure most people have bought salt in their lives, and you can see that it's iodized salt, right? The government has sort of pushed the salt companies to put salt, put iodine in the salt, so that we don't develop iodine deficiency and develop thyroid problems, right? Now they do sell non-iodized salt, but they kind of hide it. If you have to look on the bottom, because they don't want you buying it, they want you to buy the traditional regular salt that has uh, iodine in it, so that we do not develop thyroid problems relative to iodine deficiency. So, um, so now, so putting this all together, so this is a complaint I have all the time. Doctor, I'm tired. Does that mean I have a slow thyroid gland? Now, it does not mean it, you have a slow thyroid gland. You could have a slow thyroid gland, but it doesn't mean that you have one. So uh, the way to figure that out, though, is to check. And it would be important to ask your doctor, please, doctor, check my thyroid gland because I feel like something is off. But if you're talking about fatigue, let's talk about things that can be causing fatigue. Well. One of the biggest things people tell me all the time is, they tell me, doctor, I'm tired. I say, well, how do you sleep? And they say, well, I don't sleep at all. So I, so I tell them always, I say, well, you cannot, you cannot have energy if you don't sleep. So that's step number one. So it does not necessarily mean you have a thyroid disorder. But also, a big, big thing that people have in their lives is stress. Stress is the killer of us all, right? I mean, and, and, and we have stress from, we have financial stress, right? We have stress from our work, stress from our family, stress from our siblings and kids and all of these things in life. And, and this builds up and it causes people to be very tired. So if that's part of your problem, it's important to address those things and deal with that stress in a, very, in a, in a healthier way. Working too much. I think my wife would agree that I do that and that, that, that certainly counts for when I'm tired. Um, there are other things, uh, depression, anxiety, other medical illnesses, uh, fibromyalgia, too much alcohol consumption. And one thing that I think is often overlooked sometimes is medications, right? We, you know, when you have a few medical problems, Dr. Wines has you on three, four, five. I mean, I have patients on 20 medications sometimes. And when they have those problems and they have these symptoms, it's certainly possible that sometimes medications are the cause. So it's important to discuss not only your symptom, but also could your medicines be contributing to some, type, some of the way you feel. And in those cases, uh, perhaps they can either be switched or discontinued or stuff like that. So, I get this one all the time too. Doctor, I'm overweight. Does that mean my thyroid is too slow? And the answer is, well, maybe. Maybe it's too slow. But look at this guy over here. What's he eating? Drinking Coke? And God knows what that is over there. Um, so, so, so the point is, yeah, your thyroid might be slow, but it might not be. And we have to think about whether or not 
our food choices are optimal, and the physical activity uh, is appropriate. And you know, one of the things that I think comes up a lot with, with my patients in particular is you know, you get a little bit older, and of course our metabolic rate, metabolic rate does slow with age. But one of the things that comes up a lot is, you know, doctor, my knees hurt, and I can't exercise like you want me to exercise. I say, I understand that. But the trouble with those orthopedic issues is what happens when, you, when things hurt to do things? What do you do? You do fewer things. You avoid going with your family to a long trip or to Disney World or wherever you might go because you know what? It's too much walking, you tell yourself. There are small things you do every day. Oh, you want to do something in the kitchen, but you know what? Ah, I, I don't want this knee to hurt again. I'll do it later when I'm up. And those small things add up over the course of the day, the course of your life, and they cause, cause you to retain calories, not burn calories, and you, you gain weight over the long term. So the trick is, if you've got a solvable, solvable problem, if you've got that foot surgery you've been putting off, or you maybe, get, maybe the doctor told you you really, really, really need to have your knee replaced, that will help your weight, and that will help everything else when you're more active and you're more physically active. So it's important to think about weight not only as food and output, but what are your barriers to exercise? What are your barriers to movement? And sometimes orthopedic issues can be a big problem. So what other medical reasons are there to be overweight? Well, uh, something called Cushing's disease. Cushing's is when your adrenal makes too much of a hormone called cortisol, and that can be checked with a few, uh, few approaches. One is with a 24-hour urine collection that, that your doctor can check for you. Some people that have heart failure, they actually retain a lot of water, or liver failure, they retain, also, they retain excess water. There's overeating and physical activity, which we discussed for food, cho food choices, of course. Uh, God knows this, this uh, holiday season has been tough on, on a lot of my patients, including myself. So it's important that we, you know, now that the holiday season is over, we get back to making our better food choices. And the other thing is some medications can cause weight gain. And you know, I, I, I also treat people for diabetes and I give people two classes of drugs, something called the TZDs or sulfonylureas, and these are two, or insulin even, and those are three actually classes of drugs that actually cause weight gain, right? So it's important not only to look at your medication list for, uh, for the efficacy, but also the side effect profile. And of course, people are on steroids for a variety of reasons, uh, for their lungs and such, those can also cause weight gain. So, the long and the short of this is, the, th the, the thyroid can cause weight gain, but does that mean your thyroid is too slow because you can't lose weight? The answer to that question is no, although it's possible. This is another one. I feel nervous and jittery all the time. Does that mean my thyroid is too fast? The answer is, well, it's possible, and as I mentioned before, but there are a lot of other Ill illnesses that can cause you to feel this way. One is anxiety, right? Another is another hormonal problem of the adrenal gland called pheochromocytoma, when your when your when your adrenal gland would make too much of a hormone called adrenaline. So if you make too much adrenaline, it can make you feel jittery, nervous, and shaky. So that's another thing that your doctor might want to take a look at when, when you're complaining of these symptoms. Some medications can do that, or stopping medications abruptly abruptly can also do that. Also, caffeine, right? Having too much caffeine can make you feel jittery and anxious. I had a patient the other day um, for, di for diabetes, and he was telling me, you know, doctor, is coffee okay for me to drink? Right? I said, sure. I mean, you know, you know if, as long as you're not, you know, getting the, you know, the, uh, the coffees where you're putting, like, whipped cream and all this other stuff. I said, well, that's fine. I, he said, well, how much is okay? Well, I was like, well, how much do you drink? And he's like, I drink 15 cups a day. I said, well, that, that is a little bit too much. I said, you know, so, so I mean, if it was one or two, I would have said okay. But, but, but so I, I guess the point is, I guess the point is, is that everything is in moderation. Uh, but so too much caffeine is also no good. Uh, illegal drugs also, uh, for obvious reasons, can cause you to be jittery and nervous. So, the bottom line of all this, if you're having symptoms of either a fast thyroid or a slow thyroid gland, it's important to tell your doctor. The answer is as simple as a blood test. We'll check your blood, we'll see what the problem is. If you've got a thyroid problem, then we can treat it. If you don't have a thyroid problem, then you've got to move on to another thing, because Literally, something is causing your symptoms, so we've got to you know, do a little digging sometimes and find out what it happens to be. So general health tips, always go to the doctor with questions about your health, and always take your prescribed medications as indicated on the bottle. If you feel like something's wrong after starting your medicine, including for thyroid medication, it's important to let us know because we can make adjustments as needed uh, based on your, your clinical situation.
So here we do have a great thyroid team. And the thyroid team consists of a group of really, you know, special people that, that um, really work together to, for the patient's benefit. And, and who does it start with? Well, it starts with having a good internist. And the internist will sit with you and they'll talk to you about whatever medical problems you have. And they certainly will go over your symptoms with you and screen you for a thyroid problem. Many times if they identify a thyroid problem, then they will refer you to someone like me who is an endocrinologist. And we diagnose and treat thyroid disease. But sometimes, sometimes you need imaging of your thyroid gland. And then you get the radiologist, right? So the radiologist will do an ultrasound, take a look, and the radiologist will interpret that, that uh, scan for us to ascertain whether there's any problems with the thyroid tissue, including those nodules that we talked about a little while ago. And then sometimes we've got to do a biopsy. I do them, you know, every day in my office. We'll have the patient laid down, we put a needle in the neck. Um, it, very, very simple procedure. Um, the needle gauge is the same needle gauge as when you draw, you have your blood drawn. So it's a very simple procedure. There's no prep work. You don't have to fast. Uh, you don't have to stop your blood thinners. It's a very, very uh, simple procedure, office procedure. And then I send that specimen off to the pathologist. The pathologist is the doctor that specializes in looking at the cells of the body and determining if the, if the, if the uh, findings are cancerous or not. And so if they wind up to be cancer, then you would go to a surgeon. The surgeon would remove the thyroid gland. And then we work with the nuclear medicine doctors. Nuclear medicine doctors give patients that need it radioactive iodine. And radioactive iodine is um, radioactivity that will kill thyroid cancer if it happens to go other places in the body. And finally, we would work with a medical oncology team, and those patients will give rarer cases or more advanced thyroid cancer patients chemotherapy. Very, very rarely do we have to use chemotherapy in thyroid cancer, although when you're dealing with a practice like mine that you know, we see a ton of thyroid and thyroid issues, we do uh, use medical oncologists to help us administer chemotherapy. But the idea is this, is this, this is a team, right? I can't do a good job if I don't have colleagues working with me to have, you know, having, having a good team to, to work with. If I didn't have the surgeon, I mean, I've had the surgeons call me up in the operating room and tell me, doctor, these are the findings. What do you think about what I'm planning to do? And, and literally, we will, we will make a decision on the spot like that because things change sometimes when you go to the operating room, right? And you know, I've had the pathologist call me. I've had the radiologist call me and said, what do you think? What's going on? And these people contact me directly in, in the middle of looking at or doing their case because they know that I want for my patients the best outcomes and that, uh, that results when people are actually talking and communicating with one another. And I think that is the scope of the presentation. Do you guys have questions? Yeah. We'll start with the one. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there a hereditary component in thyroid? Yes, there's a strong hereditary component to this. Um, you know, it, it's estimated about 10% of the population has, uh, especially women, have hypothyroidism, and about 1% uh, of women have hyperthyroidism or a fast thyroid. And you can see this generation to generation in patients. And almost always, when I have a thyroid patient, I will ask them, "Do you have a family history? Anybody in your family, especially first-degree relatives, anybody has?" thyroid disease or, not only thyroid disease, but also a history of autoimmune conditions. And what are autoimmune conditions? Type 1 diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome. Um, these are all conditions that are associated with um, um, thyroid disease. And yes, there's a strong hereditary component. First of all, the patient is Dr. Adabax. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, picture that no justice needed. <laughs> <laughs> More handsome in person, right? What do you do for a sluggish thyroid? So for a sluggish thyroid, what you do is you would give thyroid hormone, and which would be Synthroid is the brand name, or Levothyroxine, which is the generic name. And we would increase the dose as clinically indicated by the levels and the patient's symptoms. So we increase, 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 and then we make sure that the levels are within range. Once you, once you get the levels within range, and uh, then you've got to determine, does the patient still have symptoms? And the answer, if the answer to that question is yes, we have to make sure that there's not other things going on. And one of the things that mimics thyroid disease a lot 
is, and I, and I always ask patients this when they complain about persistent symptoms, is sleep apnea. One of the things that people complain of with their thyroid is, I'm tired and I can't lose weight. Very common, almost all of them. And what I ask them is, do you snore at night? And many patients will say yes. And I say, okay, so in that case, we have to look into other problems that could be causing some of your symptoms, and that would be one of them. There's a whole host of others, but and, and of course, you, you do that with blood work and, and different tests, but that just commonly is one of the things that comes up in practice. And this is the medication that you have to take for the rest of your life? Thyroid medicine, well, with a slow thyroid, it is, it is forever. With a fast thyroid, and I, I remember if you, a little while ago, I gave you those three approaches to thyroid patients. You could either give radioactive iodine or surgery or thyroid drugs that slow down the medication. Most of us prefer, or many of us prefer, to give the thyroid medications that slow down the thyroid when it's a fast thyroid because um, a good number of those patients, depending on the study you read, 30 to 50% of patients actually can go into remission and actually come off the, those thyroid medications. But if it's Synthroid, for a slow thyroid, you need it for the rest of your life. For a fast thyroid, you can theoretically can't come off medications because you can go into remission. So what happens when you have the just in between? You're not here and you're not there. Well, then you're normal, hopefully. <laughs> so if you're not fast, you're not slow, hopefully you're normal. We can talk about the specifics, you know, after, but, yeah. Glenn? Yeah. You know, I was just going to ask, if you are not undiagnosed patient, yeah. becomes pregnant, you know, becomes pregnant, yes. What do you do? They want, you know, they, they need a thyroid medication. Where do you go from there? So, so you're talking about hypothyroid, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so if you're hypothyroid and you get pregnant, well, it's important to go to your doctor immediately, whether it's your primary doctor or your endocrinologist or your gynecologist, and they have to do blood work immediately. And you've got to know what dose you're on, so that when they get the blood work back, you know, we have we, there's a normal range, right, on the on the lab. For pregnancy, the, the normal range is different, and we, we particularly for with a measurement we call TSH for pregnancy, that's got to be less than 2.5 for pregnancy. So we measure, we, particularly in the beginning, we measure the thyroid hormone monthly for, for, for women who are pregnant because it's so essential for them not only for, for, for them sustaining the pregnancy but also for the development of the child. So if if you and if you develop a thyroid problem during pregnancy, which does happen, um, you would just go on a medication once it's identified. But what's interesting is that they, you know, most of the societies don't recommend checking uh, the gynecologic societies. So, so the, the problem is not all women are screened for thyroid disease, so you can miss some, because there really is no strong recommendation for professional societies to screen everyone, right? What else, guys? Yes? Um, how old is it? You can't get a thyroid. Young, me? Mm-hmm. It's a good question. And what, yes, so, so the question is, what age can you get a thyroid problem? And you can get a thyroid problem at age zero, when you're born, right? In fact, every child born in this state is checked at birth for a thyroid problem. Because um, if, you, if you don't have a thyroid, some, some people are born without a thyroid, then we really know other way to identify it. So every child at birth is checked for hypothyroidism. And there are infants, one or two days old, that develop this problem, and they have to take thyroid medicine their whole life. What happened, and of course I'm an adult physician, right? So um, I, I'm seeing adults, but kids, when they're you know, 10, 11, 12, can develop hypothyroidism, and, and most of my patients are developing it anywhere from their teens all the way up to, you know, up to their 90s, right? So, yes? But nobody knows the thyroid is 34 years ago, so how do we know if we were born or not? Well, the, probably 30, probably 30 and 40 years ago they did know, but, they're, but you're right, to, you're, to your point, there's a time when they didn't know and there really weren't tests for this. And, um, and then you see you know, the folks, those big goiters on physical exam, right? But there were all sorts of diseases, really, that people just died of, right? Um, what did we do, you know, for instance, with patients, you know, type 1 diabetes, right? Type 1 diabetes was a disease, well, it's, it's a disease where patients need insulin to live. And what did we do years ago for those patients when we didn't have insulin? You know, not too long ago. It was a certain death, right? It was nothing to do with those patients, for those patients. Terrible. But now, thank God, we have, a, we have 
effective, safe treatments for them, with, which is insulin. So yeah, there were people that died of thyroid disease all the time because we didn't have a modality and approach to the treatment of those people. And the thing is, we didn't, may not even know what they died of. We just knew that they were dying. You could, you know, you know the, the doctor would come and see them, and you know, they, I, mean, I, I think everybody in this audience is too young to remember, probably. But like house calls, right? The doctor would come and see the patient, and they would, and they would. Say, there was nothing really they could do for those patients, sadly, and they would just pass away. They would say, okay, they're, you know, they're dying, right? So, so the idea is. Um, uh, we've advanced, thankfully, and now we have appropriate treatments. But there were plenty of people that just felt terrible. Maybe they had enough thyroid hormone to keep them alive, right, but they just felt miserable because they, they didn't have enough. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out who needs treatment and who doesn't and make them feel their best, right? both from a biochemical standpoint, the blood work, and from the clinical standpoint, how they feel. How come tomatoes, my family is here, mm. Sometimes I don't know what they used to do. Yeah. But they, they nobody know. Yeah. A lot of people. I have a thyroid and I ask you questions. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Some of people, they don't even know what a thyroid is. Yeah. Uh, some people um, don't like to share their health information and uh, with their family. And I'm not sure why that is. It, privacy or they just want people knowing their business, whatever. I usually think it's a very poor idea not to tell people what you've got because it helps them, right? It helps them to know what a family history is. And not only for thyroid disease, but also for heart disease and diabetes and cholesterol and all these things. Cancer. The, the, cancer, right. So all of these things are important. If we don't share the information, exactly. you know, no, right. Yep. So it's unfortunate when that happens. Because when you go to the doctor, they want to know the history. They want to know. I don't have to know history. Yeah. I don't want to find out. I know. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. But you, now you have you have your own children, right? So now. So at least you have your history you can give to them, and they can share their history with you. The yeah. information is to the next generation. Yes. yes. My family. Yes. But my husband and I, we struggle to find out. What's the story? Do. Nobody knows the family. You're right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So your question is, if you have elevated thyroglobulin antibodies, and how often should you check the patient? Well, the answer is, when they're symptomatic, so, so the answer to the question is really whenever. So when I have patients like that, I tell them, look, I'm going to see you every six months, and I'm going to screen you every six months for deterioration in your thyroid function, because I know your thyroid is going to be slow. You're not there yet, but it's going to be slow. But if you ever feel X, Y, or Z symptoms, call me. Now, the problem with, the, with that approach is that uh, patients have a lot of these symptoms anyway. They feel tired, they feel constipated. They, but I tell them, you know you. you know, you've been you your whole life. You, you know when something is not yourself. And if that's the case, here's a lab slip, go for labs. You don't even need to call me. Go for the labs, and then I'll call you and I'll let you know what the story is. So I always say, every six months or as needed. Yep, yep. What food contains iodine other than salt? Hmm. Salt is really the main source of iodine in our diet. So there are a lot of other foods that have it, but it's really minuscule. And that's why it's been so important for them to put it into the salt, because uh, you know, because we need it. And furthermore, I mean, multivitamins can have salt, I mean, excuse me, have, can have iodine in them, but really, dietary sources of iodine have very, very small amounts and certainly not enough to sustain what we need. Because if you have high blood pressure, you have to watch the salt. That, that, oh, that, that's, it, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. But the, the amount that you need is, is not much. So, uh, and that's, that's the point. Because we, we heavily put the iodine in, all you need is a little bit of salt in your diet, and not much at all. And, 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 and listen, anybody that eats out anywhere ever, you, you get enough salt because they pour the salt on, so you'll get enough. Yes, oh, yep, I'm sorry. Yep. Yes. Yes. 60 milligrams and then 88 milligrams. Yep. She was retired and it killed me. I went to see her one more time. Yep. And she said, there's a problem. I want you to go to us. I want you to go to the hospital. Yep. She's done too long. Yep. Actually, it wasn't done too long. It was someone else who wasn't around. Yep. I said, why after 30 years would I have a problem? I've never had a problem. I, I, they told me I could wait till next year, but I was very worried about it. Mm. And I said, well, uh, 
so I mean, I, I probably we, we could probably handle it one on one together. To, you know, you you and I can talk about it individually, but but yeah. But the but the but the question is, you know, did you develop cancer? Did you develop? Did, you know, did the thyroid become slow? Without the labs, it's very hard for me to give you advice. But we'll, we'll talk after, and we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll uh, you know hook, hook up. Yep, yeah, we'll, we'll talk. Yep. Yes. Yes. So what do you do in that case if you have osteoporosis? So this is actually a great question. Um, you know, and, and this is um, this is one of the challenges of, of prescribing medications because they give you that thing at the pharmacy which lists a million things of how the medicine can kill you, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, and you know, if you read it, you say, "Oh my God, was this guy crazy giving me this medicine?" No. So 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 the. Uh, the, the medication thing, the, 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 the insert, tells you, talks about osteoporosis and thyroid medication. And that is true if you're over-treated. So meaning, if we're giving you too much thyroid hormone, so say you need 50 and we're giving you 100, and we're giving you those symptoms, palpitations and anxiety and tremors and all of that, that causes increased bone turnover, right? and causes thinning of the bones and osteoporosis. But if you're taking the medicine and the levels are normal and they're consistently normal, there is no reason to believe that the medicine should cause osteoporosis. So, um, so if the circulating hormone levels are correct, then this doesn't cause osteoporosis. But if it, you're being overtreated, then yes, it can cause osteoporosis. Good questions, all good questions, yes. Can you take Yes. With antidepressants and vitamin D? You can take them in the same person, but not at the same time. So meaning, um, a person can be on antidepressants and Synthroid and vitamin D, but they cannot take them at once, the same moment. The reason being is because those other medicines will obstruct the absorption of the pill. Synthroid or levothyroxine, which is the generic name, needs to be taken once a day, every day, on an empty stomach. Uh, because the other medicines will interfere with the absorption of the pill. Now, I have some patients that <clears throat> tell me, Doctor, I have been taking it this way for 30 years and my number is perfect. I, and, I, and I usually tell those patients, well, don't mess with perfection. You know, so if you're taking it that way, you're absorbing the right amount, then fine. But generally speaking, taking the medicine concomitantly with something else, it will prevent the absorption of that pill. Mm -hmm. Yes? Thyroid cancer. Yes. Uh, I understand it's prevalent on the island. Yes. Um, what What are the statistics as compared to the city, and how, how treatable is thyroid cancer? Yeah. So actually, Advance did an article on this uh, issue about well, it must be two or three months ago. I don't know if you took you had seen it. We do have a much much higher rate of thyroid cancer relative to. New York City, and in, in particular relative to our colleagues or friends in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and, and the reasons for that um, aren't entirely clear. Um, is it environmental? God knows. I mean, we had the dump for a while. We had we had we, we had these these winds that people hypothesized from from New Jersey. I don't have an answer to that question. I know that what I do know is that people in Staten Island, thankfully, go to the doctor a lot, and when you go to the doctor. The doctor examines you. And when you go to the doctor and he examines you and feels something, sends you for a test. And then he finds something. So we don't know whether or not it's a truly higher prevalence of this disease in Staten Island relative to other places. We do know that the numbers are there to support you know, higher um, numbers of patients, but we don't know if they're being screened systematically the same way. We don't know the level of care they're getting in other boroughs. So it could be that we're we have more doctoring going on here relative to other places. And um, if you don't look for something in life, you don't find it. So I'm happy to say, uh, you know, many of the colleagues I work with, the primary care docs, all these people do a great job with their patients and they're looking for stuff. And when you look for stuff, you find stuff. And that may account for some of it. Whether there's an environmental cause or something else, I, I nobody knows the answer to that question. What else, guys? Yes? Unfortunately, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mitzvah is giving up the lecture, but yes. when is the time that you do a biopsy on thyroid? 
So when, when did they get yeah, to that point? Absolutely. So the thyroid uh, can develop those bumps that we talked about, right. nodules. And when you have the nodule, that's the thing that you would consider to biopsy because that's the piece of this that could be cancer. Now, the question is, um, are they cancer or not? And we, we determine that based, especially on the size. The doctor examines you, examines you, feels the neck, or you go to the doctor for something else. And one of the one of the big ways that I find, or people find a lot of thyroid nodules, is that they go to the doctor, they complain of dizziness. This is a classic patient, complain of dizziness. One of the things that doctors do sometimes is they do a carotid ultrasound or a carotid duplex to look at the blood flow to the brain. When they do that test, the doctor sees, oh my goodness, there's some thyroid nodules on there. And then they send you for a dedicated study of that test. So it's either by, by being incidentally found because you're having another test, or because uh, the doctor felt something and they sent you for the test uh, to, to look at uh, the thyroid, thyroid tissue. But anyway, when they're above a centimeter, that's when we start thinking about doing a biopsy for patients. So you don't routinely do that? There is no recommendation to routinely check a thyroid ultrasound to see if a patient has, 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 has a thyroid nodule, despite the fact that some studies show two out of three people in the world have it. Um, weren't you? Thank you. Yes. Excuse me. Yep. Which salt do you recommend? The sea salt or a regular salt for thyroid? Well, so, so um, I would recommend any salt that's got iodine. So my understanding is sometimes with sea salt, they don't have iodine inside of it. So I would recommend regular salt. Having said that, please restrict your salt. Don't go crazy with salt. I don't want everybody going into their uh, doctor. Dr. Arnberg told me to have uh, lots of salt and the blood pressure is like 160 over 100. Please don't do that. I don't have to worry about it because my friend is the law. Low blood pressure. When I went to the doctor, I said, oh no, you better eat a lot of salt, the sardine, the olive oil, because my blood pressure was on the low side. Yeah. But then I got swollen foot. Yes. Don't go. Don't go too much with the salt. Somebody over here. Yes. Um, I heard, and I don't know if there's anything to it. The difference between the thyroid and the thyroid is that the thyroid is not as effective as the thyroid. So the FDA, when, when you make a generic drug. The FDA explicitly allows a difference in the potency of the drug, right? You can't make two, you know, you're trying to make an apple pie, right? You don't make it up the same, exactly the same twice, right? It's a, always a little bit different. So when the company, the generic companies make a formula, it's not exactly the same as the brand, say Synthroid, which is the brand that you're talking about. So it's never going to be exactly the same. So my philosophy with it is if you're on the brand, I leave you if you're doing well with it. If you're on the generic and you're doing beautifully on it, I leave you on it. But if there's a question of whether in an individual patient the potency is fluctuating or the, or the numbers are fluctuating with, and the patient is taking their medicine consistently, those are the patients, generally speaking, where I would push them to try the brand. I, I have a general philosophy in life of not to fix things that aren't broken. So, uh, so if things work well for a patient, fine. But, but, but the point is, if you're struggling, that's, that's a situation where I would push you to definitely uh, try, the, uh, try the brand to see if it makes any difference. Yep. Um, I think I'm a thyroid cancer for like 20 years. Yes. I noticed you didn't talk about that at all. So, armor thyroid is an interesting drug. Armor thyroid is, um, it's actually what we use prior to uh, having thyroid hormone in synthroid, or levothyroxine. Armor thyroid is desiccated pig thyroid. So what they do is they uh, take pig thyroids and they uh, put it in a pill. And, uh, and it is an effective treatment. It is approved to be used there. It's not standard. And what we do generally with armor thyroid, uh, well, most, most people what we use is, is the levothyroxine. We give patients what they call T4, which is the main hormone that the thyroid makes. So if the thyroids aren't working well, we replace but they're not making it with T4, and we let the body convert what it needs to the other hormone that you need, which is T3. When you take armor thyroid, it goes around that process and gives you both T4 and T3. So there are some patients that will say, I feel better with armor thyroid, which has both T4 and T3 in it. Um, 
It's important, like any other treatment that you would use for the thyroid, to make sure the levels are good. Because if we're over or under treating the patients, they're not going to feel good. They're going to get all the symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroidism. So I certainly don't object to patients taking it. Uh, certainly they want to try it and somehow they feel better with it. That's fine with me, so long as we're getting our levels to where they need to be and I'm not giving you symptoms of too little or too much hormone. What else? One more? Yep. Uh, I have what they call the neuropathy. Neuropathy? Yes. Not typically. Typically. Um, you know, neuropathy can be caused by diabetes, it can be caused by uh, vitamin deficiencies, it can be caused by a few other things. So, uh, but not generally speaking would neuropathy be caused by this unless your levels were really, really out of whack. Uh, and then, um, but, yeah. What numbers do you look for? Numbers. Uh, for the thyroid. So we're looking at the circulating hormones of thyroid hormones. So the three main blood tests that you know are checked, well, the thyroid antibodies, which can tell you whether you have Graves' disease or Hashimoto's disease. That's one type of antibodies. And then there are other measurements of thyroid hormone. Um, one is TSH, one is T4, and another one is T3. Like we were talking about with the armor thyroid, um, T3 is you know, the hormone that, uh, that is in armor. T4 is the one that is in uh, uh, synthroidal levothyroxine, and then the TSH is a global assessment, the most important value with respect to how we monitor and measure uh, people's uh, treatment and or screening for them, screening for them and treating their thyroid disease. When I gave uh, the blood work to the yeah. uh, they said they have to look at the numbers. Yep. So how do you know what the numbers? They would tell you is there such a thing as numbers or? So the numbers, um, uh, well, I think what they probably meant uh, was that the, 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 the hormone levels, as they relate to the normal ranges, that's probably what they meant. So when they say the numbers are normal, that what they're saying, I think, is that the levels are falling within the normal range. So, so that would be a good thing. What are numbers? These are levels, the actual hormone levels in the blood. So when we say the numbers are normal, that means we've measured the whole circulating. No? Well, it's a pleasure to see all of you. Yeah, yeah. 